Well, automation is what human beings have been trying to do for all of engineering and industrial history. We want to take labor, human labor out of accomplishing a task, whether it's making something or performing a service. And that's been going on since the dawn of engineering. And so people say, well, it's different this time. Yeah, it is, it's better. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephen Parton, and you're listening to The Feedback Loop on Singularity Radio. This week, our guest is Mark Mills, a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute who recently authored the book, The Cloud Revolution, How the Convergence of New Technologies Will Unleash the Next Economic Boom and a Roaring 2020s. More specifically, Mark and I discuss in this episode how the latest advancements in materials, machines, and information are unlocking a profound new paradigm represented by the digital cloud, the impact of which Mark argues has been severely underestimated. As part of this conversation, we also explore the ways that such technology will impact automation, governmental regulation, and our ongoing tension between climate and energy production. As Mark describes himself, he is indeed a realist and an optimist, and both of those things are conveyed here in this very information-rich episode. So without further ado, everyone, please welcome to the Feedback Loop, Mark Mills. Right away with authors and anyone who's spent the time like you've spent investing themselves into a subject so deeply... Uh, Can you just talk a little bit about, to start, what motivated you to write The Cloud Revolution? Well, what I tried to look at, what I've spent a lot of my life doing, whether it's writing about technology or investing in it, especially writing about it, is to look at, to sort of step back, and it's it's a trivial thing to say, but it's actually hard to do. So to step back from the details, to look at the architecture, the pattern of what's going on, but that requires then once you think you've seen the pattern to dive back into the details to figure out if the pattern is true without engaging in confirmation bias. And that's obviously hard because we're all we're all creatures of our own biases. <clears throat> but I think there's something really big going on in our economy, and it's it's more than more than just computers computers have got faster. Mm-hmm. I mean, yes, they have. That's like saying airplanes got faster. Uh, which they did for a long time, uh, you know. Then that's then it stopped because physics limits were hit, and, and we'll we'll hit physics limits on um, physics we know and computing as well. But that will not end the impact of computing any more than you know people thought we'd be having daily supersonic flight today. If you looked at the trajectory of the rate of improvement of the average aircraft from say 1920 through about 1960, at 40 years, it was pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and so a lot of people extrapolated that, thought we'd all be flying supersonic on everyday flights and doing, you know, hypersonic around the world. And it turned out that was harder than people thought. It doesn't mean we we'll, won't we'll never do it, but it's harder than people thought. And, and computing is very much like that, where everybody's focused on speed. Remember, the early days of computing, uh, all the advertisers talked about how many gigahertz the CPU was. Then they stopped talking about that because the clock speeds didn't increase very much. Computing power went up especially what you got for your dollar, but that didn't get any much faster. S- same kind of physics reasons. So I wanted to look at the implications of the semiconductor revolution in the context of everything else that goes in society. And I divided the world into the three buckets that are the only three buckets of what everything of things that make up everything in civilization. Civilization is made up of just three big buckets of things, machines, that we make to do stuff, grow, move, fabricate, transport, whatever. Machines of all kinds, lots of kinds of machines. Materials that we build everything from. The quantity of materials we build stuff from has changed, so dump it materials, because you can't instantiate anything without materials. We live in a material universe. The virtual reality exists on physical machines, just like in, the matrix, they're, they're real <laughs> anyway. And the third domain, of course, is information, understanding the universe 
the forces of nature, but also understanding the materials and understanding the machines. It's obviously a symbiotic relationship among the three spheres. But when there's a revolution in all three spheres simultaneously, when there's profound advances that are materially different, no pun intended, than what we've been doing for decades, and they happen contemporaneously, more or less, that convergence is unusual, and it's happening now. It's only happened once before in recent history, a century ago, around 1920, we had a, a very similar revolution in the three spheres. Of And then, of course, it was easy. The machine revolutions were, you know, the, the, the airplane, the car, and electric power plant, those kinds of machines. <clears throat> and there were others, but that was the, the big ones. And then, of course, in materials, the revolution then was in uh, alloys, uh, far superior metal alloys, and polymers and pharmaceuticals, which was the dawn of the chemical synthesis era. In information, we had the dawn of instruments and ideas about science in the 1920s that were truly remarkable. And we professionalized science roughly around that time. It had begun earlier. Same things are going on today, same same uh, domains, same kind of confluence, which I think is, you know, profoundly optimistic um, mm -hmm. for the world. Not a naive optimism, you know. As I wrote in my book before the, which was published before Russia invaded Ukraine, I said the obvious, you know, wars will always happen. Human beings are what they are; they keep fighting. I mean, I don't like that observation, but saying that we have an optimistic future is not a way of predicting that that we're going to live in a utopia without conflict, without political conflict, without racial conflict, without economic conflict, all those things are sort of locked into human nature. So they happen in parallel. So that's that's a long way of why I wrote it, but I wrote it because those things were in my head for some time in my work and my reading. And I've written a lot about each of those things separately. <clears throat> and then uh, I thought, you know, I, th I felt like it was an opportunity to synthesize it into a sort of one magnum opus about what's what's going on in the three domains and what it means um, yeah. for jobs, for healthcare, for entertainment, education, things that matter to people. Yeah. Well, to start, can can you just kind of first show us how that convergence matters to the cloud? How how how's that connection take place between this revolution of these three domains and the way the cloud is rising to, I guess, ascendancy? Yeah. Well, the the thing that the thread in the book, of course, is the cloud, which is why I ended up titling it the cloud revolution. So the cloud it epitomizes the confluence of the three spheres. It's built from materials that are really different from anything we used 20 to 50 years ago. It's obviously an information machine, but what's more, far more important is it's an infrastructure. And we don't make new infrastructures very often. So if you map out the history of civilization, let's stick in mod relatively modern times. I mean, the canals were the first sort of significant transportation infrastructure in the world, and certainly in America, followed by railroads and you know telephony, telegraph and telephony, and uh, highways, airways, and the internet. That's, I mean, I've just about covered the whole, that's the whole schmear, right? That's those, and infrastructures are incredibly important because the reason to call them infrastructure is that they infuse all of the stru structure of society and they're foundational. People use highways for much more than going to work. In fact, only about little or 20% of total road miles in America are devoted to going commuting. Uh, Pre-COVID lockdown and post-lockdown, it's only a couple of percentage points lower, in fact. It's lower still, but not a lot lower. Surprisingly, traffic around the world is back to where it was, as any of us who've driven lately have figured out. But the highways are used for moving goods, for entertainment, for, you know, McDonald's was created, fast food restaurants were, were essentially created because of the highway. Uh, but you wouldn't call McDonald's a transportation technology. So we call a lot of things tech today that are built on information highways. But they're not tech. They use tech, just like McDonald's was it made possible by the highways. So infrastructures are really, really important. The cloud is an infrastructure. It's not an infrastructure of communications. It's an information infrastructure that uses communications. And when I say that, it's obvious when you state it, but it's important to have that in one's head because the cloud is as different from the internet as the internet was different from telephony. It's a non-trivial step function change in what it represents. 
So it uses telephony. People use her quote telephone, but it's, you know, it's actually using the infrastructure of telephony, both wired and wireless. It uses the internet, obviously, but it doesn't have a lot of the cloud's functionality isn't on the internet. There's more intra cloud traffic in a data center than there is traffic to and from the data center. And the more we do complicated things, AI to do machine learning to understand how to make to, well, how a virus is operating, for example, all that data churning doesn't isn't on the internet. The queries are on the internet. The knowledge that's gleaned from doing the churning comes back on the internet to the scientist. But the majority of the data traffic is inside the cloud. So it's using the internet as a way to connect to the world where it collects data and to human beings that want to know what the data is you know, data crunching means. So the cloud is different and it's different in that structural sense, but it's also different if I were measuring it in physical or dollar infrastructure sense, it's really different. I mean, if you measure it in miles, which you can, because it's connectivity, it may be invisible. There are, there are visible cables, you know, fiber cables <clears throat> dominantly now, but if you measure it in miles, it's orders of magnitude bigger than either highways or airways. I mean, it's an astonishing network of you know, hundreds of billions of miles of connectivity, which continually expands because the virtuality and the virtual nature of the connections could keep expanding because we can. Th that matters. That's, I mean, I would just say it's consequential when you have a network that is so big and expanding so fast. Or if you measured it in dollar terms, which is another way of doing it because all infrastructures cost money. And we build stuff and uh, we have to spend capital on it. It's it's actually fascinating to note that the annual spending, uh, annual capital spending to expand what we call the cloud is now bigger than the annual capital spending globally to expand the electric utility industry. Pretty, it's a, this is consequential. And, and if you say, which is gonna grow faster in the future? Well, you don't have to be an analyst. You don't have to be an engineer Economists know the cloud's going to grow faster because, simplistically speaking, electric demand grows roughly with population and wealth, roughly speaking, and the invention of new things to do with electricity, of course, right? So there's that. But the, the cloud's growth grows with our appetite to do something with information. And the, the if there's one thing that's infinite, in effect, and there are very few things that are infinite in physics of the world we live in. It's it, it's probably information, the data, because the, the, the magnitude or the scale of what we want to collect information about and the granularity with which you might want to study it, it's essentially unlimited. And as I make it cheaper and easier to do to, to access and use the data, I'm going to have to expand the infrastructure. And of course, the key, the last key thing about the cloud, which is phenomenologically different, and everybody knows this, but I don't think people really, this is a case where the hype is less is less hyperbolic than the reality, which is pretty unusual because the tech community is, is, is very, very accustomed to hyping things. You know, disruptive innovation, this changes everything. No, it doesn't. A lot of things don't change everything. And some things don't disrupt what you think. In fact, the disruptor gets disrupted. I mean, it, it, it's complicated as they say, but... But here's, here's the thing that is quite remarkable. Obviously, a marginal dollar spent on a highway, which at best gets you that much more highway. Sometimes it gets you a little more highway if we get more efficient at construction and more efficient at producing the raw materials. And a marginal dollar spent on a uh, airplane, air airways, gets you a linear increase in the airlines, roughly speaking. And as airplanes get more efficient, and they have, you get a little bit of a bump. But everybody knows the marginal dollar spent in information systems gets you much more than the last dollar because we're still on this declining class curve, the so-called Moore's Law, but it's more than Moore's Law. So the analogy that I made in my book is, uh, is if we consider a measure not of speed, but of what people buy, it's, let's use transportation infrastructures. If we look at the dollar spent in, in like a fare to go somewhere, some distance, not not downtown, but to go to another city or go to another country. The dollars per per uh, foot per second, 
because speed matters. The precious thing is our time. We want to get there quicker, more quickly. So how many dollars you spend per foot per second of transportation service? Well, that's actually improved 10,000 fold in the last century. Well, that's why there's so many people traveling in the world. That's why tourism has become a huge industry. That's why, because it's gotten cheap to, to buy transportation. If measured in the, in the metric that matters, dollar, you know, dollars per foot per second. And it, it's remarkable when you map that out from the sailing ship to the stagecoach, to the car, to the airplane. And the next leap, which I write about in my book, is actually the drone. It's not Elon Musk's airplane. It doesn't, uh, spaceship rather, it doesn't get you there. It actually is, it reverses the trend. Space travel turns out it's a lot harder than the hype would say. We're, we don't have, we haven't conquered the physics of gravity yet, but we have done a lot more on the other stuff. So you got a 10,000 fold improvement in the metric that matters dollars per foot per second for the transportation service in a century. The, the era of computation that was pre-computer got better at 16 fold per decade. The air, so which is not nothing. You got almost 2000% more computations per second per do, you know, dollar spent, computation per second per dollar got better, 16 fold per decade, 2000% per decade. The computing era, the first computing era jumped that up uh, a remarkable amount, right? We, we went all the way up to, um, let's see, it was uh, about 2,000% per decade. Sorry, the electro electromechanical area was a 700% per decade, misspoke, and the uh, computing area was almost 2,000% per decade. Again, and the measure was computations per second per dollar. The cloud era is growing at a thousand fold, not a thousand percent, but a thousand fold in computations per second per dollar per decade. Or put differently, in 10 years, the measure of merit, computations per second per dollar, instead of travel feet per second per dollar, in 10 years, it's gone up 10,000 fold. It took a century for transportation to go up 10,000 fold. So that has, to, you don't have to be, you know, you know that has to be consequential. That, that has to have a have meaning. That, how does it get realized? That what, what forms does it show itself? Well, it shows itself in how we discover and how to use materials. It shows it how we build and manage machines. It shows it how we do education, how we communicate. It shows it how we do research. And it shows it how we do how we do medical development. It shows it how we can, uh, you know, change the very structure of how we allow healthcare to operate. And, democratizes democratizes uh, knowledge and information in ways that have to be unprecedented. So we're all we're seeing the hints of all that already. But I think they're just hints. I think that's why I wrote the book and the things that we're seeing or will begin to flower in the next decade. That's why the subtitle yeah. is Roaring 2020s, despite the the mess we're in now. Yeah. Uh, the 1920s began with a mess and uh, we're just sort of copying the 1920s. <laughs> but those hints you're talking about, it seems to me like they are the seeds of a positive feedback loop that once it catches its traction and, you know, kind of crosses the elbow with the curve, we're going to see that massive explosion that you're kind of talking about. Yeah. And why, why, with that kind of awareness in mind, with the awareness that when you build an entirely new infrastructure like you've talked about this is an entirely new infrastructure in a very small chain or list of infrastructures that we've done over the past century uh, or two um why do you think there is this pessimism why do you think this isn't something that's more hyped if, if you know that these infrastructures tend to launch entirely new industries like an entire fast food industry like the highway did why is there not this uh, very, <laughs> why why is there pessimism and not just pure optimism about the fact that like, oh, we're about to launch a whole new industry with a feedback loop? Yeah, this this is the, the social psychology question as opposed to the physics question, okay. uh, uh, which I have opinions on because, you know, I'm out in the public space. I speak mm -hmm. and write and talk and argue with people, <clears throat> you know. Um, it's interesting. I have again in my book. I, I write a bit about this, uh, the psychology of of communications. I quote Marshall McLuhan, who is a fellow Canadian, who was famous for the statement, "The medium is the message." Uh, but what what he did as a as a clinical psychiatrist and researcher was look look at these big picture phenomenologies about how communications affected people, how they reacted socially. So uh, you know. Pessimism is is easy is easier than optimism, 
because if you're optimistic, you get accused of being a Pollyanna and not aware of the fact there's bad things in the world and bad people. It's the first thing that people comes in their heads is, oh, you're just not realistic. And also, um, you know, Neil, Neil Ferguson wrote a, a new book. Uh, I apologize to him for not getting the title. It's about the catastrophism, catastrophizing things, his new book. And he writes about the history of catastrophizing. Human beings like to catastrophize things. First, it makes a better story, whether it's a news story or a science fiction story. You know, the apocalypse is a much better story then things are going to be okay. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, uh, that's, I mean, I like apocalyptic stories. Who doesn't? I mean, if you think about all of the, all of the great stories over all of history, they're about things that go wrong. And of course, saving the world or saving the her hero or heroine or whatever. So there, I mean, there's that. There's, there's also, um, you know, I, my the appendix of my book is, is writes about forecasting. I give, I spent some time and have for a long time, and I may convert the appendix into a book, in fact, about forecasting, because others have written books on forecasting. Uh, forecasting is an interesting problem because it, all of us suffer from presentism. This is one of the things I point out. We we look at where we are and we think what we live in is a unique time and it's uniquely bad. Or, and, you know, there, things are, you know, this time it's different. You know, well, some things are different, but the pattern may not be different. What's, you know, the war itself is different, but it's still a war. And it started because somebody did something stupid or somebody was really a predator. I mean, that's, the patterns are there. The, um, I think politicians generally do better. I mean, you know, the political zeitgeist that we're in is, is not new if you read history. Uh, being an alarmist, again, because of the human nature reacting to negative news uh, is sort of po the political leaning. So if you, you put it all together and then when things are actually not going well, because things don't always go well, not everything goes well. We have high inflation now. We've got a war in Europe. We've got, um, you know, racial division and social debates about all kinds of stuff. Um, and it feels kind of depressing. I mean, when I wrote my book, I didn't read the news in the morning because it was very hard to be focused on the big picture and not be depressed if you read the news in the morning. So I would read it afterwards. So I, so we are in a, uh, um, a time and it's, it's never smooth. Sometimes things are calmer. Some things, things are messier. We're in one of the messier times than rather than a calmer time. So it makes people depressed. I mean, not just the political uh, storm and drunk we have, which is, could be depressing to pretty, I don't care what party you're in. I think pretty much all my friends of both stripes are pretty, not happy with the state of affairs. I think only people pay no attention to the political news are happy with the state of affairs. And the polls don't show that there are many of those out there. So it doesesn't really matter. You feel sort of enervated as opposed to energized. And there's another factor, which there's a camp that I call the new normalists in my book. Uh, these are the people, and they're serious people. I don't mean to make fun of them as new normalists. I, that's a they believe that we live at a time of a new normal of slow growth, that the innovations we have coming now are incremental rather than foundational, that once you've invented the airplane, you can't invent it again. Once you've invented plumbing, it's a one-shot deal. Uh, fresh water and plumbing changed more lives and saved more lives than probably any single invention, more than antibiotics possible. Well, they're probably comparable. They're sort of saying, certainly, certainly more than vaccines, more people were saved just because of clean water and, and, and sewage. Uh, so these are those are uh, what you've done at once. How do you how do you get more? The mass production line is a one time invention. You go through the, the car is a one time event. So, so the computer one time deal. So the, that those are all old inventions. They were very they changed productivity, propelled wealth, and since there's nothing more foundational to event except better apps, better zooming, better video games, which are all make money for people, but they're incremental. They're not society shifting inventions. That thesis, in fact, is true. We have we have lived through an interregnum of foundational inventions. It is true. You can't point to, you know, if you look at 1920 and you look at your world today, there are very few things that exist today, except that they're better than existed in 1920. One of them is the computer, which actually is consequential. The other is the cloud, which is 
really consequential. But if you took those two things out and you didn't understand what they meant, you would say, how much has changed? You can play video games and you and I can talk in a Zoom chat. That's nice. It's not world changing because we could have picked up a phone that Alexander Graham Bell invented. And it's like 80% as good as a crappy Zoom call. You know, we can hear each other just fine. And if we want to get together for business, I can get on a train instead of a plane, which a lot of people still prefer, and go see somebody or a car because there were cars then. <clears throat> so that argument uh, has truth that there, all those things are better, which is consequential, but they're not, the, the equivalent of them haven't been invented. What I wanted to look at was is, is the answer to the question, are there things comparable to that which have been invented and not fully utilized? Not things you could pretend I could invent one day, but have been invented or not fully commercialized, not fully utilized, not deployed into society. The radio, for example, was a big deal, but it was invented 20 years before people had radios in their homes. Marconi and uh, had made the transatlantic transmission uh, very early after the dawn of the 20th century. And ships had radios for, for almost two decades before RCA introduced the home radio. And, and then it took off. And then within a period of about eight years, we went from no homes with radios to about 80% of homes. It was just as fast a rise as the rise of cell phones or smartphones. Very, very fast, very similar. The knee and the curve, when it hit, to your point, happened very fast, but it took two decades of engineering development to get to the knee. And it took the decade before that, after the, for in fact, the idea of a radio wave predated the first radio by a couple decades. That pattern is very common, which I write about in my book. What I try to show is that we are very close to the inflection point of many things that were recently made commercial, but are not a significant use. By that, telemedicine is not really a significant use yet, but everybody post lockdown understands what telemedicine is now. But they don't know really fully appreciate what its power is, except for a handful of people. I was with a an older woman recently who had an AFib attack. She was, I think, late 80s. And, uh, you know, so she's not very tech savvy. She had one of the carry around EKGs, which she put her fingers on and used her smartphone to look at and can, to, can tell if she feels bad whether she's having an AFib attack. And as you know, the new uh, Apple Watch can do the thing for you automatically. This is th that kind of thing plus more. It's really consequential. It's very different than the way the world was 10 years ago. and But it's the, sh the share of the population that have access and are using what I would call democratized diagnostics for, for medical and health conditions, it's trivial, right? Uh, but the tipping points is visible. It's, it's just in front of us. And that will bend the cost curve in healthcare. That will make healthcare different and democratize it. And these things will be consequential because if you bend the cost curve on healthcare, we free up the money for other things like fun, like tourism, or or for buying a, a, a ticket on a you know air taxi, which you know it's been hyped a lot, but it's it's a it's a little harder than a lot of people realize. Um, harder in a regulatory sense, not harder harder in the engineering sense, but it's around the corner too. Now we don't have to guess anymore. It's probably three hundred plus variants on um, piloted and unpiloted air taxis based on various versions of of quadcopters, drones, multi-rotors, all kinds. There's not just one design because there's a lot of ways to approach this. But that quantity, and there's billions of dollars of money flowing into that space with venture funds and not just venture funds. Airbus is all in. So is Rolls-Royce and so, so was Boeing. They, they will, they will, they will come up, there will be a product, <clears throat> a service, and you don't have to guess it's going to happen, but it's not obvious who the winner will be because it's like all engineered things. No, Nobody knew, if we were using the uh, internet and cloud as an analogy, nobody knew that the, the world would see Amazon be the, the successful dominant cloud player back in the 90s. Nobody knew that. I mean, I, I, we were around then. You can read what people said. You can Google it up. Nobody knew Google was going to dominate. <clears throat> lots of players and lots of contenders. But you knew that it was a big deal, which is why Wired Magazine was practically frothing at the mouth 
right about e-commerce e in the early days, if you remember, it was just irrational exuberance over e-commerce. And it took a while though, you know, we're, we went from like 0.1% retail and e-commerce at that time to probably, if you do all retail, we're at 12, 14% now, but that's, that's a hundredfold Huge. increase uh, in those 20 years. That's, that's consequential. Yeah. Are there, are there things right now that you're seeing maybe in one of those three buckets um, that you can give as examples uh, either of convergence of new foundational shifts or maybe something that you'll think in 10, 15 years, it's going to be the Amazon and Google of today. We're going to look forward and say, oh, that's, I should have known yeah. that in 15, 20 years, that was going to yeah, dominate. Yeah. You know, this is that it, it's, I, I, I'm going to eventually do a sort of investor map, sort of take my book and do a parallel <laughs> map of how to think about investing in each of the trends. And of course, Investing too far ahead of the curve isn't worth anything I right. mean, for an investor. 15, 20 years, no, nobody cares. And it's really hard to guess the next 15 to 20 months. Uh, that's where all the money's made, of course. But So I don't want to get into the Robin Hood camp of, uh, of, of meme investing in this space. But yeah, sure. I mean, if you think about um, some examples in each of the th three domains, the machines and materials and information, and, and I... And I didn't try to cover all possible examples in my book. What I tried to focus on were iconic examples that were demonstrably and clearly real and not notional, as opposed to this could happen if somebody did why. No, this is what's already happened and people, businesses are doing it. <clears throat> on the machine space, it's, it, the, the answer is mobile robots, anthropomorphic robots. I mean, we've liked robots, we, I mean, society, apocalyptic writers, the rise of the machines. I mean, robots are actually in Greek literature going back to 800 BC. The idea of mechanical, you know, animatronic men, women, animals, very old idea. The word robot, as a lot of people know, was created by a, a Pole who, Kopek, who wrote, uh, you know, Rustrum's, you know, uh, robots and he created the word. So we've liked this out for a long time. It's bit, it's it's hard to make uh, an anthropomorphic robot. The reason you would make an anthropomorphic robot is that we're humans. We're anthrop. We're, we live in the Anthropocene, and helping humans in their human environment is maximized if the machine can operate in your environment with you, without hurting you, being an aid. Whether it's on a factory line in a warehouse or in a hospital, or at home, and so it would have to be anthropomorphic. It's not, if it's on wheels, it's it has to have roads or flat spaces, all that. So that's always been the goal for that class of robot, for obvious reasons. <clears throat> it's taken a confluence of um, materials, machines, better motors. The electric motor itself has gotten fifty fold, which is you know five thousand percent better in the last 35, 40 years, which is really remarkable. It's shrunk down in size, better batteries, a lithium battery. Uh, better actuators, better sensors, the, the constellation of things. They've all come together. And um, we we don't have to guess. Again, we can use YouTube or Dr. Google and uh, look for videos of proto-commercial robots doing pretty remarkable things. Boston Dynamics, of course, gets the gets the prize for this for the, the best stunts with robots. And of course, there's Spot Mini, which was introduced commercially earlier this year is a commercial anthropomorphic robot, a dog, but it's you know it's anthropomorphic in that sense. This, this is no longer speculation. Uh, and since robots to manufacture them, set aside their application, which that's a little harder to think about. Some, there's some easy and obvious applications. You know, uh, the, the Navy and DARPA funded it because they want firefighting robots to go where people operate to put fires out without putting people at risk. That was their motivation. Uh, so it has to be a has to be a walk where people walk, open doors like people open and put out fires. So, but the fact that their machines are the closest analog to manufacturing a robot is manufacturing a car. The automobile is the single most complex and expensive product that human beings buy. Your house is not a product; it's a asset. So, whereas the products are depreciable, and you know. That's what they are. The car, the robot is is more complex than a car, but it's very similar. 
And so I would I, I I propose in the book, and I think it's I don't I think it probably happens within a decade, but it may take a little longer. Manufacturing robots will be as big an industry as manufacturing automobiles. And it's an industry that doesn't exist today. Wow. There there aren't really in terms of the mobile robot universe, there's industrial robots, the arms. Sure. And and well, it, that, that's consequential. So if I if I switch to the material side and say, well, what would be a revolution we all we already know is happening materials it's a it's a class of materials we call meta materials there's there's lots of new materials like graphene the new classes of semiconductors for high power control electronics gallium nitride and silicon carbide <clears throat> there are the, a whole set of what we would call smart materials self healing materials self assembling materials but if you're going to pick a, a material class which is remarkable is these meta materials by using by using the kinds of machines we use to make uh, not microscopic but nanoscopic transistors, we can we can manipulate nature at the atomic level the way physicist Feynman imagined, you know, the room at the bottom, mm -hmm. and make materials that exhibit properties that don't exist in nature, like invisibility. The favorite one, of course, is invisibility, and making a, a surface invisible as light appears to pass through it. Mm -hmm but it's not actually glass, is no longer theoretical. It's, of course, being done. That has really interesting implications uh, for all kinds of products. The other material that's maybe more immediately consequential are the class of materials called bioelectronics, or so-called, sometimes they're called transient electronics. These are biocompatible electronics, therefore biocompatible computing and sensing, that uh, is programmed to do something and then disappear, self-destruct harmlessly. So put simplistically, the idea that you could include in your vitamin pill or whatever homeopathic thing you want to take each day, uh, that in inside it would be a biodegradable computer that you would take each day, a one-a-day one -day computer. Why would you eat a computer? Because it would measure and tell you lots of things about your body's microbiome and your state of health, wirelessly connect with your personal body area network and tell you a lot about your 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 own your own health and give data to your physician when you see them when you don't no longer have to ask the question, what did you eat two days ago? Who the hell remembers? Yeah. But if you have the data, right, you, you this kind of thing is not crazy. So biocompatible materials are already in, in production, already FDA approved. Um, so we don't have to speculate that there's an industry there. That industry will be as big as the silicon computing industry at some yeah. point. And the information side, the obvious candidate <clears throat> is AI, which is profoundly misnamed. Uh, and I think Professor McCarthy, who's still alive, would probably, I don't know him, would probably agree. I think I've seen him write as much, that it was a bad term. <clears throat> the term uh, artificial intelligence has salience roughly to calling a car an artificial horse or right. an airplane, an artificial bird. We can make artificial birds. Uh, we have made them, right? You can see ornithopters, they fly and they look pretty cool, very, very realistic. They're not very useful, they're stunts. Uh, airplanes are more useful than birds, but they perform a similar function. AI is, is very useful and can do things that we can't do, but it's not art, it's not intelligent. So part of the misnomer uh, is is in the in the language, and, a, and there's a large swath of the engineering community, as you probably know, that's that's trying hard to flip the nomenclature around. Instead of AI, it's because it's called IA, intelligent automation, where the the automaton is not whether it's a virtual automaton, which would be an AI answering a question. Or whether it's a physical automaton, a robot walking, is doesn't do computing because that's not what you want. There's, computing implies a precise answer. In the real world, we just have to have advice that's probably right in the right direction. It's how you drive cars. That's how you answer medical questions. That's intelligent automation. Mm -hmm. So AI and machine learning are extraordinarily powerful tools, and we've just begun to figure out first how they operate, how they how they work, and how they'll work, and but I, we don't have to guess that it's getting cheaper fast. We don't right. have to guess that it's important and useful because it already is being used. And we don't have to guess that we're on the early edge of the curve of making it, the stuff better because there's an incredible arms race going on now in the semiconductor world to make better, faster, cheaper AI chips. And so we're sort of, I would say if we're picking um, an analog to 
the silicon CPU era versus the AI era, not GPUs, but mm -hmm. inference chips, let's call them. It's kind of, it feels kind of like we're about 1995. Mm. You know, we're, yeah. we're past the first stage, you know, 70, the first Intel CPU was 20 years old at that point. And it was pretty, you know, computer chips were pretty good, but boy, have we made them better since 95. I mean, holy schmoly. Well, this, this tells me that, you know, as you're saying here, we don't need to guess with robots. We don't need to guess with machine intelligence or AI or uh, IA. Um, with that being said, it seems like we don't need to guess about automation in general. What, what do you feel about the impacts of that in terms of, you know, bringing it within the scope of the Roaring Twenties or of the societal impacts? What is automation as it seems inevitably, as it seems to be inevitably happening, going to do in the next 10, 15 years to society work, you know, what have you? Well, automation is what human beings have been trying to do for all of engineering and industrial history. We want to take labor, human labor out of accomplishing a task, whether it's making something or performing a service. And that's been going on since the dawn of engineering. And so people say, well, it's different this time. Yeah, it is. It's better. That's how it's different. We're accelerating it a little faster than any time in history. Again, because in large part, because of the cloud, the cloud brings uh, the information capacity to do an automation, what was very difficult to do in most of history. So the, the automation is a wealth creator. So the simple, the simple, simple reality is that we have arrayed forces to allow us to automate far more things than ever before, both knowledge tasks and physical tasks that will, that will accelerate faster than in the past, which is wealth creating because the very definition of productivity is fewer inputs for more same outputs, which is what creates wealth always has. However, it creates these anxieties. You know, we, this is not the first time people have claimed automation will kill labor. We won't have any jobs for anybody. And I quote some of this in my book. That there's lots of books that have gone back and found, you can find hundreds of quotes. You don't have to be a researcher now with Google because it automates that function. You can find lots of people claiming there'd be no more work for anybody because of automation. And one of the graphs to put in my book is an obvious one. If automation were, were job destroying, then you the, the one trend you would see for the last century in America, we'll just pick the one century. You can pick two centuries because we've been automating farming and manufacturing for two centuries at least, would be the unemployment rate would continually rise. It would just keep going up and up and up uh, as, as automation progressed because we've been automating everything. I mean, everything from steel to farming to, you know, to, to uh, services. You can't, there's nothing that we aren't trying to automate and haven't successfully automated compared to years ago. And instead, the unemployment rate oscillates based on other factors. It has what's gone up uh, in the last century or two is, is per capita wealth because of productivity, which in effect is almost entirely because of automation. So that doesn't mean we don't disrupt jobs. 60% of the kinds of jobs, the classifications of jobs that exist in the 1960s don't exist as jobs today. So automation in effect destroyed those jobs. It's obvious, right? We're from the typing pool to the, the famous, you know, infamous teller, if you go back further in time, you get, so the Luddites were right, right? You know, the famous Luddites who broke all the automated looms because it destroyed their jobs. It did, it did, it took their jobs away. So there are there are jobs that are eliminated and it does cause, it can cause social disruption. Uh, and this is where social safety nets come in. That's why we have unemployment insurance, but the overall result on society is vastly better. The main thing different today from the all other periods where automation, and it goes through so spurts and cycles. It doesn't, it's not linear. You know, you automate things and then and then you can't do better and you have to wait a while till I know how to automate something different. So it's fits and starts. But for the first time in history, the tools that allow better automation are the very same tools, which makes it easier for people to find jobs and get retrained. Because the, the thing that we all know is true is that if, if you need a different skill, or you have to go somewhere else to find a job. Yeah, I can date myself. I mean, I was obviously a, a practitioner of the business world before there was an internet. I mean, because the internet wasn't useful till the 80s. So you had, 
Only people born in the 80s have lived in the era when there's never been anything about an internet. But prior to that, if you wanted to find a job in an adjacent city, your job disappeared in your city, it's very hard. You'd have to ask somebody to send you a newspaper or you have to go to the library and look at the newspaper for the a city somewhere else. You have to do it every day and go through all the different papers in different cities to find a job for the skill you had. This is beyond obvious, easy to do now. Now, whether you should, should or want to move, is, Americans are very Americans are very mobile, so that's not a big impediment for most people. But this has been made easy because of the internet. It's been even easier because of AI, because most job search stuff now runs through an AI engine, both on both ends for you and for the for the job seeker, the job <clears throat> the job the employer. And the training gets easier because of virtual reality and automation and computing. So. We've never had a point in history where the the disruptor was also an enabler to, to smooth the disruption, which is, I think, a, a remarkable thing. So, I, And it's promising in this sense, because I think the disruption will go faster this time, which means we better hope we have a better way to ameliorate the negative effects. There will be there will be negative effects. It's not not it's not a it's not avoidable, as you know. And I, and I don't say that in a callous way. I mean, Again, it's like saying there's going to be wars in the future. I don't wish there's wars. There's going to be wars. We'll have depressions again and recessions. Those aren't caused by technology. They're caused by politicians. Yeah. And and what do you think, speaking of politicians, of the regulatory landscape for all of these things, how do we maybe, like you said, ameliorate some of the negatives? Do you think that the regulatory bodies are even going to be able to keep up with something like that? this convergence when it's an in, it's inflection point is the human condition ready to navigate that fast of a transition a phase transition like what are your thoughts on the the regula regulatory aspect well i i think uh the idea that the pace of change is happening faster than we can manage is i'm not don't i'm not in the camp that think that's that's true and i think to know that's not true just requires reading history mm. uh so you have to sort of categorize what we mean by a pace of change. I mean, but if we look at what was going on in the 1920s and the pace of change that occurred then, contemporaneous with a lot of social disruption, race riots, horrific race riots in the 20s, really grotesque. If people haven't read their history, they should read what was going on then. It was pretty, pretty, gro pr pretty, pretty grotesque. Uh, if we look at the social disruption, the pace of change that occurred in what was called the second steam age in the late 1800s, and the same was true in the early 1800s. And by the way, the same was true in the fifth and 14 and 1500s, which was the first industrial revolution. So, we, and by pace of change, I mean the rate at which um, new things emerged that changed how we could do commerce, how we could war fight, or how we could communicate, or how we, they, they, they've they happened frequently over history at a very rapid pace. So he, human beings are, are pretty resilient and adaptable. We may not like it. We may fight, we may argue, and, you know, Vote for people that other people don't like on all that stuff. <clears throat> That's always true, but we but we we manage through it. It's not a unique thing. Mm -hmm. So I I'm not pessimistic about that. I don't believe that we're at, at any kind of acceleration that's not manageable. So I said before, I think we're we're going to see an acceleration more like we had in the twenties, which maybe that makes some people uncomfortable because we went through an interregnum where the the you know the biggest change was that the World Wide Web came along and. AOL, you got mail, and that seemed really like a big deal. Oh, things are changing fast. And then we got cell phones. Oh, things are changing fast. It's still a telephone. Yeah. See, there's more telephones. Okay. But we went from no telephones to every home having a telephone just as fast as we went from everybody having no cell phone, everybody having a cell phone. So th these are not new sort of cycles. Uh, but they are, it's new to maybe a, a, our, our particular time of this decade because we had a slower period for a while. We got, we got used to the slower pace of new stuff and it's picked up again. We'll be fine. Yeah. Um, you know, I just, I think we'll, we'll, I think it'll be exciting. I, that's why I think it will energize people. I think what happened in the 1920s, the roaring twenties, the flappers, the jazz age, this, it, to my mind, it was no accident that those happened contemporaneously because mm -hmm. the automation created wealth. The wealth created time for other things. People were kind of excited about what it meant and what the future was. They still argued about the negative effects. Um, yeah, I mean, of course. And, it, it, and and we had a Great Depression after that, too. But that wasn't caused by technology. It was caused yeah. by politicians. So 
the, the political, but the, your question about the regulatory space is an important one because that that is a that is a new feature in our economy that wasn't as extant, let's say in the 60s, 70s. We have a much bigger regulatory state for better or for worse. The good stuff is sort of we've all agreed there are things we like to regulate about clean air, clean water, all that stuff. Okay, fair enough. But then the regulatory state sort of went run amok a little bit. I wrote a piece a while ago pointing out that the reason we have less manufacturing in America is not because we can't manufacture, is we chased them out of the country with regulations. They mm -hmm. went to other places where their regulatory burden was less onerous, not just the labor cheaper. Labor was, if you look at the data, honestly, it might've been half of the factor, but it's probably a third of it. Two thirds was just the time value of money. If it takes me six months to build a factory versus three, four years, I'm gonna go where it takes six months. And that that's a purely a regulatory feature, the per permissions. So the, the regulatory state itself will eventually adopt the tools of artificial intelligence and computing, They'll, they will more automate, they'll be getting better. Now, so make, that scares some people because the you know the man is watching you. I don't think it's as much that the man is already watching you, uh, but I do think some efficiencies will come into the regulatory state. What will come faster is on the consumer side, the business side, is that if the regulations are complex, if I have if I have to hire a team of accountants and a team of lawyers to read a thousand pages of different documents to figure stuff out, that's a lot of sand in the gears. Mm -hmm. But if I have an AI engine that can read it and parse it and say, for the new factory you're going to build, if you do these things and you do it this way with this agency, these are your path outcomes that'll look better. The complexity is made simple by AI and, and analytics. And that's beginning. I mean, a lot of that's already already happening uh, in, infra in infrastructure projects. It hasn't solved the problem in the sense eliminated regulations. But it's certainly taken a lot of the friction out, and will take a lot more of the friction out. So I, again, I'm, you know, expressing optimism about AI doing that. But I, I, I base it on uh, evidence and facts. I, I know as you know, in a way of full disclosure, I'm a, a, a non-operating partner in a venture fund that looks mm -hmm. only at software for energy. In one of the most common startup companies we find, are companies that automate, sort of the. Le regulatory labyrinth, if you like, the paperwork labyrinth of systems, in industrial systems, yeah. to so you have fewer people spending hours doing that. Does that eliminate jobs? Yeah, sure. But they're jobs that most people you don't you don't want. You want somebody doing things that are productive. This is an unproductive use of time and labor. Yeah, I, I know we're getting short on time, but I'd love to briefly touch on something you mentioned there which is energy. I know there's a lot to be said for energy and climate change, and that's that's a whole nother hours of conversation. But I know you mentioned before that the the energy cost of the running the cloud is enormous. Given, given that, and what I would say is potentially an energy crisis for, for lack of a better term where we're at right now, are you concerned about our ability to sustain the, the energy needs of the cloud? Uh, so the one, the, no, short answer is no, I'm not worried about it Okay. Yeah. Uh, in, in the macro sense. But yes, I am worried about it in the micro sense. In the short term, we'll make some, we may make some really dumb decisions that will increase costs or degrade reliability by by being, uh, I guess I'd call it ham-handed about aspirations to make changes faster than they can be made in industrial systems. Because energy is a big, big industrial supply chain infrastructure that involves lots of big machines, big trucks, lots of steel, lots of concrete and glass. It doesn't matter what you're building. You build, use lots of materials, minerals, concrete, glass, mines. It takes time to mo mobilize, form, move, build. And trying to do it faster, I'm not impossible, but extraordinarily expensive and difficult. <clears throat> so a lot of the a lot of the uh, memes out there about an energy crisis are self-inflicted because they're they're memes created by self-infliction. We don't have an energy problem. In energy, just spoken from a physics perspective, is infinite in supply. It was a subtitle of my earlier book on this from years ago. Uh, there's lots of energy flows available and materials in the in uh, on planet. It's all about machines and materials and what we want to spend and where we want to put the machines and materials. And they're different choices. They have different qualitative impacts and different quantitative impacts. So the cloud is another measure of its 
scale uh, and all of its manifestations, you know, building, operating, it's roughly twice as much electricity as the country of Japan uses for all purposes. So it's a pretty big infrastructure. It's, in energy equivalent terms, it's already surpassing global aviation. Hmm. So it, it was a non-existent energy using system uh, 30 years ago because there was no cloud. Now it's now it's like aviation and it's growing faster, both in energy consuming terms and in productivity terms in aviation. But the uh, the desire to stop using hydrocarbons is sort of the center point of what's going on all over the Western world, not so much not so much in Asia and Africa. Uh, setting aside what they say, what they're actually doing, you know, China's electricity is two thirds coal fired. It's true in Africa, uh, and coal burn is going up this last year, not going down, gone up by almost a billion tons per year, and that's because the world needs electricity not just for the cloud but for everything, lights, air conditioning, factories. So the you know the world's not going to easily reduce its use of hydrocarbons. In fact, I've written about this many times. It we're not going to reduce it at all. In, in my opinion, what will happen is the net increase in energy needs for the world will be increasingly met by the addition of wind and solar, and uh, largely wind and solar, but also other things, but mostly wind and solar. There's not many other options, and especially nuclear bringing up the rear, but I think taking over because the only phenomenology from an energy materials perspective, and as you know, in my book, I have a chapter called the, the Energy Materials Nexus. Everything about energy is about materials, materials you use to build machines and the materials you use to, to operate the machines. So you use steel and uh, largely to build combustion burning machines, but you don't, if you, if you build machines that don't have combustion, solar arrays, wind turbines, okay, but you use a lot more materials to build those machines per unit of energy. When I say a lot more, most people don't really understand. And it's amazing when you tell them, this is not a design flaw. It's about a thousand percent increase in mining of materials, metals and minerals, to produce the same unit of energy from a wind turbine or solar panel compared to a combustion turbine, thousand percent. Okay, yes, you're not burning gas or coal, but or oil, but you're you're mining a lot more stuff, burning oil with the big machines. But maybe one day they don't have to burn oil, but right now they do. But you have to disrupt a lot of land, and you have to get it from somewhere. That's in the physics of energy. I cover that not from a viewpoint of being pro or anti anything in particular, but from an physics and technology perspective, I'm profoundly optimistic about finding better and different ways to both use and produce energy than we have today. But they they take time. Just back to talked about earlier, my 20, I have a 2020 20 rule. You know, after discovery of new physics to do something like a new form, a new battery storage chemistry, a new superconductor that's you know low te high temperature or room temperature, it's 20 years before you get to the first uh, realization of that invention as a potential commercial execution. Then it's 20 years after that, roughly, before it actually shows up as a commercial product. And it's almost 20 more years before it significantly impacts markets. Lithium ion battery, the chemistry for that was invented in the 70s, mid 70s, by a chemist at Exxon, wow. which is kind of ironic by itself. Yeah. <laughs> Exxon was planning to make build lithium batteries for cars because that's they propel cars, they didn't care. They invented it. Uh, three people got the Nobel Prize for it because there were two other scientists that helped perfect it. But if you measure it from the mid 70s, the first uh, commercial lithium ion batteries, which were very expensive and used for electronic products, showed up in the mid 90s. And then it was almost 20 years before Elon Musk's first Tesla S, before the lithium battery had scaled in manufacturability and we understood the chemistries and the designs well enough to make a car. Now we're almost 20 years since that, right? We're pushing, not quite, we're about 15 years since the Tesla S launched. And the global electric fleet of all, you know, all light duty vehicles is, you know, almost near 1% now, 1%. Yeah. yeah. Uh, will we accelerate that over the next 20 years? Yeah, 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 sure. 20 fold, pick a number, but that, that'll get you to 20% of all cars. But the number of cars in the world will have gone up to 2 billion instead of 1.2 billion. And we'll still be burning oil for all the other ones. So what I write about in my book is that that's the nature of trajectories. And so we don't have this magic wand to change those things. So I'm 
I'm both a realist and an optimist. I mean, you can be both. That the and, p- and people are confused by like they it's kind of like the patting your stomach and rubbing your head thing. Uh, it, it's possible to understand inertia of mm-hmm. economic systems that are huge, but also understand that that if you're far enough along the path, then you know some significant changes can happen. I think right. the biggest changes in energy we're going to see are not going to be in wind and solar. There'll be lots more of those in electric cars. Electric cars use energy elsewhere. That's self-evidently, both in making the machine, it uses a lot more man. The average electric car uses 300% more copper, for example. Hmm. You're gonna have to mine a lot more copper in the world, which has got, got consequences as well. But it, the the resurgence of interest in nuclear energy is, is maybe the single most optimistic feature of our future energy infrastructure, because we've spent 50 years trying to figure out how to make nuclear plants cheap, reliable, and safe. And we're pretty much on the cusp of being able to figure do it now. Yeah. And it's not for want of trying. It just turns out that that engineering physics has been very hard, not not as easy. Gone a little slower than airplanes, but airplanes went pretty slow because you know if you compare to when it became a common a common way to travel in the sixties, from from the first aircraft and it's forty years yeah. from the first aircraft to making it a fairly common travel mode. It was 50 years before a lot of people flew in the 70s. So it was 50 years. Space, spaceships, so the same thing. Space is actually a lot harder than everything else because because the gravity thing. But we're, you know, Elon Musk is getting and Jeff Bezos are getting us closer. And uh, but we'll solve that problem with nukes, by the way, not with chemical rockets. So we're going to get to Mars on a nuclear propulsion in ways that are sensible, and and that'll help things on Earth. So. You, and and we'll get better faster because we'll back to AI, the ability to simulate the design of a machine mm. that's hyper-realistic and what's called a digital twin has been imagined by engineers ever since the first computers. They said, oh, this is great. Yeah. I can put a digital twin of a human organ. I can put a digital twin of a nuclear reactor and make it operate like the real thing. Yeah, you can, but it takes a supercomputer to do that. And it takes a super, super computer in fact, we know that it takes computers that can operate at exaflops, not petaflops, mm-hmm. which is a really big number. Well, the first exaflop computer is now operating. And you know, just 10 years ago, people thought it would, would that computer would take 500 megawatts to run. That was the estimate. Yeah. 500 megawatts is a nuclear power plant. I mean, it's enough to run a city of uh, roughly a half a million people. Wow. But it, it turns out it takes 50 megawatts with the design we have. 50 megawatts is essentially 747. That's what the power, that's a lot of power for one computer, but it's a lot easier to do than 500 megawatts. And so we'll build lots of those. And then the next one will be five megawatts and we won't build 10 times as many of those. We'll build a hundred times as many, which is why we got to where we are with the cloud using Japan worth electricity. Yeah. Efficiency gets better. Our appetites use data expands. But with that, we'll, we'll find um, better photovoltaic cells, better batteries will invent, all those things will happen. But they won't happen in the political time frame that our our political class would like to have happen by throwing money at it. Money's good. We need it. I mean, Silicon Valley lives and breathes on money. Engineers need money to build big machines. But some of these things are like that, you know, it, it's, I don't think it's a uh, a sexist joke to, because to say that you can't, you can't have, you know, three women have a baby in three months instead of yeah. nine months by concatenating it it doesn't right. work that way you know it's biology works everybody takes nine months engineering is very similar when you build machines you have to build the prototype to see how it works then you build the improvement on the prototype you can parallel path some things but again the ai digital twin allows you to build the first prototype in a virtual mm-hmm. space which can take some years out of it so that's yeah. a, a long answer to the energy one. You say, I mean, you're right. Energy is, is consuming everybody these days because we're, we've are we done some really dumb things in Europe, yeah. which is causing pain for everybody. And the dumb thing was obvious, uh, trusting Russia. I mean, I wrote about this at the time saying I, I, I would prefer to ship American natural gas to Europe at a slight premium than trust Russia. And not as a, not as a replacement for the windmills, they, they got their whatever. The windmills aren't solving their problem. Yeah, and they can't. And they can't. Yeah, I'd love to have that conversation. I already am taking uh, taking you over time here, Mark. So I want to honor honor the set aside time we have here. Um, this was a very 
uh, information rich and optimistic conversation, which is a combination <laughs> of things that I really enjoy. And I, I feel like you don't get enough of, I will give you one uh, quick chance if you'd like to leave a final word, obviously we'll promote the book and the show notes and whatnot, but if you'd like to leave a final message or talk about anything you're working on, feel free. Well, I would say that I'll come back to where we started about, um, why do people pessimistic? Mm. Uh, and the reason I wrote the book is I, I think we can be realistic about the political challenges and we have to we have to deal with those problems the world has. But the reason I wrote the book is there's reasons to be optimistic and therefore reason to solve the challenges. Getting the politics right matters. That means something different to everybody. But but typically we, we sort it out. I'm Canadian that I'm emigrated to America. I think it's a great country. I think it is, in fact, one of the, you know, the, the most promising uh, provinces in the world to advance things for all of humanity. It doesn't mean other people aren't smart and do good stuff. We just we just have a lot of advantages in America for a lot of reasons. So I'm I'm as an immigrant that adopted this country, optimistic that we'll sort out our political differences, eventually come to some reasonable compromises and and that's will be great for, for the country, but profoundly uh, good for the next 50 years. I think this is America's century. And I don't mean that as a sort of a a, a xenophobic, you know, rah rah America. Uh, although I, I feel that way about this country. That's why I came here. You know, it's not like a, you know, people that come here come by accident. Uh, yeah, they choose to come here. I'm among amongst them. Although I was a documented alien, just for the record, <laughs> I didn't walk from across the border <laughs> in Canada. I got my papers, but that's a whole separate argument. And we've have always had document undocumented aliens in America. By the way, this is a very old. It's a very old, a very old thread. But it, it, it is, um, I think it's important to to have a sense of optimism of what we can happen. And in fact, my favorite economist, Joel Moikier, who is a Nobel class economist, his most recent book, he begins his first line with, and I and I guess I, I can quote him pretty accurately, that economic growth depends far, far more on what people believe than most economists would admit. And he's an economist. And believing the future can be brighter is actually consequential. Yeah, it, it drives growth. It doesn't drive naive, you know, slobbering optimism. It, but it, but it drives, drives growth and reasons for compromise. So it's, I, I end on that note only because I know in people's heads when I talk as an optimist, they think, oh well, haven't you read the news today? Look what so and so said. Yeah, I know. <laughs> of course, yeah. I read the news. I know what he or she said. It's whoever the he or she is. Doesn't matter. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that uh, as an end note. I like ending on an optimistic note. So Mark, thank you so much for your time, man. Thanks for having me. It's great.